Please stand. We're going to start out with singing to the Lord.
of my favorites. Looking for a city. You guys oh, may be seated. Here. Looking for city, Praise Brother Herman. Praise Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Yes. my heart this week. place like where Jesus was. So the thorns get very big and it's poisonous. I was reading this morning. I mean, it's it's got poison. It's got a milk. When I cut these off, I'm going to make some more of these plants, uh, propagate them. But um, he suffered. They wanted him to suffer. And this 
If you want to come up and look, these thorns get so big and they go deep into the skin and that poisonous milk that comes out, is, it just tortures and it's very toxic and poisonous. And he had that, and it, they say when it dries, it gets tight. So he suffered so much for us. And I pray that you'll get Holy Spirit in your heart from this song. This has made me think of that, that plan I have, the crown of thorns. was wonderful, wasn't it? Amen. Got your Bibles turned with us, if you will, to the book of Luke this morning. Amen. And uh, I just pray that you understand that we should not have profited off of the death of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, 
in that we are called the sons of God. Amen. And I, I want to do something for you uh, that is for me. Every now and then, I get selfish and I want to do something. And I want to do something today to tell God how much I love Him and how much I, I, I just cannot express how much God means to me. And today I want to preach to you a message of what a child can bring their father. Amen. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, and I'm going to be up front with you very, very honestly about this. This is a message that I have had, uh, that the Lord gave me in 2011, Father's Day uh, 2011. And every year, the Lord would bring this message to my remembrance and tell, speak to my heart and say, Brian, this Sunday, this is Father's Day, this year. And I've always said, Lord, you know, I don't really want to do this. I, and I've put it off. I, I'll be honest with you. Pastors do that. I, I just want to be honest enough with you today to tell you that I'm going to preach to you about me. And preach to you about my life. And oftentimes, this one's going to be a little different. No fire and brimstone. This one's not going to be any great jumping up and down. No uh, animating or nothing like that. It's going to be me. And I am going to bear my soul to you. And I believe that so many times what we need in the pulpits is for you to see that men who stand up here have the terrible, terrible, terrible days sometimes. And we have terrible years and we have terrible decades and we have terrible sometimes lives. And I know that you look up here and you say, man, that pastor must have it all together. He's got the best of singers. He's got the best uh, building. He's got the best piano player. He's got the best congregation. But I want to tell you what, the weak link in all of this is me. Your pastor is the linchpin of the church. That's why the Apostle Paul was so adamant to Timothy. He said, Timothy, I want you to be able to preach the gospel, whether it be in season or out of season. He said, there's going to come times when raving wolves come against you. There's going to be times when uh, lions are trying to destroy you, but you've got to be able to stand. And I'll be honest with you, there's been times I've been driven to my knees. Now, it's not from the world outside, it's not from the church inside, but oftentimes in a pastor's life, pastor is more often than not damaged, defeated, and discouraged within his own family. And I don't know how to tell you this other than to tell you that what you see on Sunday mornings is a lot of bravado, a lot of, uh, if you will, a, a sense that I have to present to you that I have it all together, but I want you to know I don't. And I'll be honest with you that if I don't have it all together, how can you tell me you've got it all together? Because I preach, I pray, I prepare all the time try my best to work for the glory of God. I spend countless hours in prayer. I spend time studying all these things, and yet I find myself oftentimes at the end of the day wondering what in the world went wrong with all this thing. Where did it blow up? Where did, it, where did the train get off the track? And I'm going to preach to you today a message that I'm not too thrilled to preach but it's about me. What children bring to their father. Luke chapter number 15. Luke chapter number 15, verse number 11, is a continuation of Jesus as he's speaking through and teaching through the parables. And he comes to this parable, and he begins to relate to us about children and fathers. And today being Father's Day would be no greater time for me to explain to you some things that children will bring to their father that are oftentimes the defeat that the devil desires in their lives. Let's read with me, if you will. The Bible says this, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that follow to me, and he divideth unto them his living. And now many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed the swine. 
And he would have fain have filled his belly with husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to, to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I want to preach to you a message, what a father can bring to their son. I want you to look, verse, five, verse number 11, is that this starts out, instead of a great celebration, it, it, it is basically turned into a great uh, chaos. A, a deliberate dishonor by this child. Now, so many people need to understand that this child is not named. He is not uh, given an age. He is not given a demographic, if you will. It doesn't tell you where he is, whether he's in Samaria, Moab, or whether he's in Jerusalem. It doesn't say because the Bible says that they want you to understand that this is a universal story that teaches us a lesson about what a father can get from his children. Dishonor. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly that in the last days, there will be a generation that does not know the God of heaven. There is a generation that is proud, boastful, those that turn their back upon the Lord. There is a generation that will question whether God even believes that he exists. And this is the generation that we live in. We have children today in my family, your family, other families that absolutely have been grown up in church, have seen the Bible, read the Bible, studied the Bible, know the Bible, but yet they do not trust that God is even real and that God has any authority or any question in their life. And that is what is going on here in verse number 11 and 12, is that there is this dishonor that the young son presents to his father. Now, I want to tell you something this morning, that one of the greatest dishonors to a father is that when the father is wanting to lead to the Lord and the children deny the Lord that you've gave your entire life to, it is absolutely one of the most heartbreaking things in a pastor's life, in a father's life, to study the Word of God, to preach the Word of God, to walk as best as he can in the Word of God, but yet his children turn away from the Lord and walk away. The Bible is clear and very clear with examples. Let me give you just a few. Number one is Esau. Esau was a man that had seen, and yet he turned around and walked away from his father. Another was that of Absalom. Absalom saw what God did in David's life. Absalom understood what David stood for. Absalom understood that there was no God but Jehovah, but Absalom walked away. My friend, I want to tell you something today, that one of the greatest dishonors that a child can bring to their father is to walk away from the Lord. And you say, well, preacher, they, they wouldn't say that to you. No, no, they don't say that to me. Well, sometimes they say that to me. Sometimes they'll say, hey, your God isn't my God. I need to get a better God. And sometimes they say it to your face, but other times they just live it in their lives. The dishonor that is brought to this father that we're looking at here in Luke chapter number 15 is this, that the younger son said to his father. Now, first of all, I want you to know that it was a, a deliberate dishonor. He said, the youngest son said to the father, and if you understand the Greek of this passage, he's not debating it with his father. He's screaming it at his father and saying, your God is not my God. Your God is no good. Your God can't do what he says he does. I'm going in my own self, and I've made myself a God, and I am going to live my life, and you and your God cannot tell me what to do. Dishonor. The Bible says this very clearly. It says that, in Ephesians 6, it says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And what does it tell us over in the book of Proverbs? It says that fathers teach your children about God. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments to honor thy father and thy mother. 
And my friend, I want to tell you something, that when my children or your children come to you and they basically say to you or show to you that there is no God in their life, they will basically say that you are not equal to or above them in authority and that you really don't know what you're doing, Dad. I want to tell you something today. There is a great dishonor in not following the God of your father. I don't know any other way to say it. There is a great dishonor in not following the God of your father. Now, I'm talking about a, a, a father who is seeking after the Lord, a father who is trying his best to lead in godly principles, a father who is trying his best to demonstrate through his failures. There's none of us fathers perfect, but through his failures, he still tries to manifest the name of God and to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, and yet children will turn and dishonor their father. By walking away. So how, what can a child bring to the father? Dishonor. Dishonor. Second thing is this. It's found in verse number 12 also. A destructive demand. Not only is it a deliberate dishonor, but it's destructive to the family. It's destructive to the, 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 whole, uh, the whole authority, the whole uh, algorithm of a family. You know, husband, wife, children, right? Nowadays, we live in a world where it's take care of the children, and then whatever's left over, the mother and the father get it, right? It's kind of reversed roles. Children take care of themselves. Children take care of their wants. Children take care of their wishes. They deliberately demand that they get theirs first. When I was growing up, and in the day of old, uh, there was a time when the parents ate before the children ate. Right? You remember that? I, I, I was probably 15, 12, 15 years old before I got to sit at the Thanksgiving table with the adults. Nowadays, kids are laying on the couch and won't even get up for an adult. I'm telling you what is happening is, is that there is a deliberate dishonor in denying God and then there is a destructive demand. The Bible says this in verse number 12, verse the second part. He makes it his, his deliberate dishonor and then he makes a demand. He says in verse 12, he said, Give me the portion of thy goods which falleth to me. First of all, he's misquoting scripture. And second of all, he's dishonoring his father. Look with me, if you will, in verse number 12. Father... Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He's making a, a demand. He is in his father's face. He is saying it as aggressively and as abrasively as he can. He is demanding like a little child and a lollipop that the father take what the father has and take it and distribute it to the son. And he's not saying it in a nice way. It's not a suggestion. It's not anything that, that you would understand. But he said, you are going to give me half of what you got. In the old days, that didn't work. In the new days, there's laws and license and all these lunatic things that are saying, I won't... We've got 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, we've got 40-year-olds who've still got their pacifiers in their mouth wanting their parents and demanding from their parents things that they do not have a right to have. And so here it is, is that we get this deliberate dishonor and now this destructive demand. He's saying, you need to get, I want half of everything you got. I told you that it was non-scriptural. It's not. You see the Bible makes a designation in verse number 11 that he had two sons. In verse 12, it says the younger son. The younger son was never entitled to the dowry of the Jewish father. It always went to the firstborn. So he's making a demand that is destructive, dishonoring his father to even speak of these things. And now he, like a spoiled child, is saying, I won't, I won't, I won't. Give me the portion of goods. And then he misquotes it. Look what he says in verse 12, the last part. That falleth to me. Now the father is demonstrating love. He could have said, well, here's nothing because that's what's going to fall to you. You can have it. I'll even package it for you and put it in a bowl, take your nothing, and hit the road, Jack. But he didn't do that. The only thing I'm, here, the only thing you, that I'm going to give you that you don't deserve is the sole of my shoe. But he didn't do that. 
He sits there and takes it. I'm telling you what a father can, uh, what a child can bring to their father is simply this, is that it is a disruptive demand that is deliberately dishonoring the father. I want to go just one more. There's, there's a couple more in here. This is a rough sermon for me and you. There is a deliberate dishonor. There's a destructive demand, but now he's departing in disobedience. Look what it says in verse 13. In verse 13 it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey to a far country and took his journey. Now I want to tell you, in Jewish history, there was nothing worse than a child who would abandon their parent, their father. You could not do anything that was more looked upon in a negative connotation than to leave your father. Jewish sons stayed with Jewish fathers and they built close-knit communities, the close-knit families. They, they listened, they worked together, they lived together, they died together, they fought together. This was the Jewish uh, culture in such a way that it raised up a nation that no man could put under. But now this young man is disobedient to his father. He is disobedient in such a way. This young man didn't want the authority of his father over him. He wanted to be the top dog in the kennel. He wanted to be the big cheese in the bag. He wanted to be the, all that. He wanted what he wanted, and he didn't want any authority whatsoever from his father. He was departing in a disobedience that was so uh, cast down upon that his name in Jewish culture would not even be mentioned in the city. He would not even be, his name would not even be written. He would not have any recognition at all. They would take and scrub his name from all records. This child said, Father, give it to me. Give it to me and I will go away and leave you and leave your God and leave all the good that you've given to me. I see that all the time. You know, as long as I'm giving, they loving. But when I stop giving, they ready to go. I'm saying this to say that we need to be careful what we are giving our Father. We need to understand that a dishonor, a deliberate dishonor for our fathers is really dishonoring God. And when we make a demand that is destructive to us in the family, it is really destructive and demanding to God. And God saying, haven't I given you everything you need? Haven't I gone the extra mile for you? Have I not given you all good and perfect things? And yet we're sticking our nose up at God and we're saying, listen, we want it now. I don't care. And in disobedience, we take what God has given us and we go out into the world. Right? I mean, we do. I, I'll be honest with you. There's times in my adult life, in my family life, that I believe that if there was any way that they could market air, I would have died of an asphyxiation. My children. And your children. And America's children are takers and not givers. They are sponges and not fountains. And we have grown up in this generation where God is pushed aside, He is dishonored, we make demands and we disobey, and then we say, we're departing, turn the lights out when you're over. He says in verse 13, not many days after the younger son, it doesn't say whether it's a week, a month, or a year, but it says not many days. And he took his journey. Where did he take his journey? Did he take his journey to a better place? Thank you, Miss Connie. He didn't, did he? When you leave God's plan and God's purpose and God's power, you're never going up. You're always going down. It says in verse 13, He gathered together all and he took his journey into a far country and there wasted. He went down. Days of departing from God, dishonoring God, and disobedience to God always brings a pathway that leads down to destruction. And yet, here we see this father 
what the Son has been given him. He's got him disobeyed. Well, let me tell you, this is where we're going to change it just a little bit. The Son has walked away. The Father's still standing there. What's left for the Father? Look in verse number 13 and 14. What's left for the Father? The Bible says this in the last part. And there wasted the substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now, all the focus, if you just superficially read this, goes to that poor little son, poor little Johnny, poor little Joe, poor little Sally. Bless their little heart. They're down there, and they're laying in a pig pen. They're shucking corn. They're starving to death. We've got to do this for them. But I want you to back up the road a little bit. What does the father have? Do you stop caring? Do you stop loving? Do you stop longing for your children to do what God wants them to do? No. What happens? The Bible is very clear that the father did not follow him down into the city. You know, so many times we chase our children and trying to pull them out of this pit, try to pull them out of this trouble, try to pull them out of this. And I've got, I've got all those T-shirts. I've got all the, I've got it, I've done it all. I've chased them down roads that they shouldn't have been on, wondered how in the world did I get where I'm at, standing in the middle of chaos and total hell, and thinking, how in the world did I get here? And the Lord says, you big dummy, you chased them down there trying to get them out. You cannot get a man out of a hole if you're in the hole. It took me years to realize this. Don't follow, he didn't follow them down in there. But he had still this love that never stops. And I'm not going to ask you, but fathers and mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, you, there's got to be times you get on your back porch and you just cry because you're so, you're so depressed about where your children and your grandchildren have departed to. You say, Lord, where... What, why are they doing this? Why are they doing all these things that they're doing? Why have they went there? Don't they know how much you love them and how much I love them and how much you good have for them and how much I want to take? Lord, what is the problem? The problem is, is it goes back to the heart of the child where they are dishonoring God. They are demanding and they are disobedient. But yet, who pays the greater price? Is it the one down in the pig pen who is wallowing with the pigs? I want to tell you, no, it's not. Because when you're down in the pig pen because you've done all these things, you kind of, you can't say, well, I do. I'm, uh. But if you're the father or your parent and you're trying to do the best you can, Following the Lord, daily searching God, daily praying to God, daily doing the thing God wants you to do, all these things, and you still see that your child is down there, who hurts the most? And yet that child says, you don't love me because you don't come down here and get me out of the pig pen. Thank you, Brother Herm. You don't love me if you don't get me this, or you don't do this for me, or you don't go there for me. And... I just want to sometimes just scream to the high heavens and say, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're in, you're, you're in physical pain. I know it's no good eating corn shucks. I know it's no good kissing pigs. I know it doesn't smell good where you're at. But my friend, I want to tell you something. It's a whole lot worse up here with me because I want to tell you, it never leaves a parent who loves the Lord and loves his children. It's constantly always there. And yet, so many times, we, we internalize it. We, we bury it. We put it back. We try to paint it up. We try to blow it off. We try to forget about it. My friend, I want to tell you something. I can't forget about it. It constantly, from the morning that I wake up to the night when I go to sleep, it's always something that is reminding me to reach up to God and say, God, help me to deal with this because my child, my children, and your children are down there and it brings days of depression and darkness to us. Can I get a witness? Have you ever been there? It breaks your heart. And it doesn't last a day or two. 
It lasts your entire life. I want to say today what a child can bring their father are days upon days and nights upon nights of darkness, depression, and defeat. I've often wondered, if my children were the golden children, what great television program I'd be on. Being honest with you. Would everyone know my name like they know the name of Billy Graham or Charles Stanley or Adrian Rogers? You see, they're walking around, and I'm sure they've all got their problems, but I'm saying from my point of view, they're all walking around, they're sailing their sea on smooth seas in a yacht, and I'm trying to swim with two milk jugs and a 55-gallon drum of concrete tied to my ankles and trying to stay above the sweet, and I'm thinking, God, I'm going under. Children are pulling me under, God. Look, old brother Charles Stanley, he, he's got everything going for him. We do that. I do that. God, don't you... A child, I want you to understand something. Who dishonors and demands in disobedience will destruct a father's ministry. Because the prayer time that I'm praying for those in the, in the pit pen, I should be praying, God bless them even more. God do mighty things in their life. I've always said this, and I, I'm going to say it to you. I've only had one standard for my children. Now listen real closely. And this, I, I've, over years, I've developed and I, I will live and die by I hear it all the time. Oh, you expect me to be perfect. You expect me to be... No. There's only one thing I expect. Be one step better than me. Because I'll never ask you to do anything I've not done. I'll never ask you to go where I haven't gone. I'll never ask you to give what I haven't given. I Just be one step better than me. That's all I want. That's all this father wanted. Days of depression and darkness... He said, man, Pastor, this is a terrible sermon. Said, yeah, it is. I'm, I'm opening my heart to you. I'm, I'm opening my life to you about fathers and how I feel. He said, man, this is uncomfortable, Pastor. You ought to be me. But it gets better for this guy. Look what it says. It says the day of decision came, verse number 17. This is where I'm kind of between verses 14 and 17 right now. Okay? I, I've got the T-shirt for the first four. But I want that T-shirt for the fifth one, Miss Connie. I want this one, a day of decision. Look in verse number 17. The Bible says, And when he, the son, came to himself. Which one's worse? Making a mile back and totally not making it home or never even taking a step towards home. I, I would say that it's making it a mile away from the house and turning around and going back. Amen? So he said, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's bread have enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. He comes to himself and he makes a decision that maybe, just maybe, just maybe, the father knew what he was talking about. That the father always made decisions that would benefit the children. Phil, you're the newest married one here with children. Okay? I want to I say this to you. Always make decisions that are for your children's good and never for your comfort. Now, I've tried to do that all my life with my children. For their good. Made decisions for their good. Come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about. You want to be at home sitting on the recliner watching the ball game, but you work that extra shift because they need shoes. Come on, guys. Come on, girls. You know, you women know this. You know that you want them to have the best of clothes, so you work that extra shift or you take that extra. You, give, you say, well, I really, don't, I really don't want a new dress. 
but you get your daughter a new dress. You sacrifice for your children. And a good parent does that. What a bad child does is, is doesn't see it. And that's the generation in which we live in. Instead of seeing the sacrifice, they just gulp in like hogs in a pen and say, feed me more, feed me more, feed me more. He knows, here, look, a day of decision. He knows how long the prodigal had been away. No one knows how drained the father must have felt. And it was a day like every other day. Now, I'm about to get into the hope part. The day like no other day, the father's doing the exact same thing. The Bible tells us he's rich. The Bible says that he is uh, a, a godly man. The Bible tells us that he's doing what he's supposed to do. He's doing exactly the same thing that he did yesterday. He didn't quit on the Lord. He didn't go away. He didn't quit. But he looked up, and one day he saw something down the road. This is where I'm at. Every morning when I wake up, I'm praying that today will be the day that I look down the road. Every night when I lay down, I'm thinking tomorrow's going to be the day when my children dedicate. Because the Bible says that without hope, we perish. I'm not giving up on God because God has promised. Train up a child in the way that it should go. And when he is old, what does it say, Brother Herman? He shall not depart from it. So I've still got the responsibility to do what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to do it. And I'm looking for a day of decision where my children finally, after they've chased all the swine, all the pigs, all the, the corn husk, all the smell, all the ridicule of the world, when they finally turn around and say, you know, Dad, Maybe God is as great as you say he is. Maybe God is who the Bible says he is. Maybe God is what I need to be focusing on rather than everything else. And then whatever else I've got, I'll give to God when it's convenient. I'm telling you what a child can bring their father. And the greatest thing that they can bring is a day of decision to dedicate themselves to the Lord. He said, and when he came to himself, we need some families that will stand up and their children to stand up and say, I've come to myself. I realize that what I've been chasing, what I've been saying, what I've been doing, where I've been going, what I've been feeling is all wrong because you have always said, Dad, that the Word of God is true. If it's true and there is no God like our God, and serve him. Joshua said this in Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Why is that? Joshua said there is no other God in heaven. Paul said this in Philippians chapter number 2. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Now the question is, will you bow in service or will you bow in in judgment. But my friend, I'm telling you, you're going to bow. You're going to bow. And when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. That is that day of decision that we are looking for, and it begins to get a dedicated desire. Look in verse number uh, 20. The Bible says this. A day of decision leads to a day of that is truly a dedicated desire. Now, the Bible says this in this story, and, and you don't know how uncomfortable this sermon is to me. I share with Brother Rick and some in the church that I almost got Brother Rick just to preach for me, to get me out of doing this. But God had finally put me into a spiritual corner and said, Brian, it's time, do it. And I'm trying to be obedient to what God would want me to do. And, and quite frankly, this is about my growth in Christ that I actually express to you and to express to the world that a father, I, I, what a child can bring a father is sometimes not good things. Now, you know, the ugly ties and the little cards and all that stuff, great stuff, you know. But quite frankly, I've got a whole tractor-trailer load of this other stuff. I've got a tractor-trailer load 
of destructive demands. I've got a tractor trailer load of deliberate dishonor. Depression and darkness. Man, I've been to some deep places. Crying tears. So bad that sometimes my wife would just come and she would tell me, she says, You've got to you you can't do this. You you can't be that way. You've got to come you've got to do come out of there. But the Lord the Lord's the only one who can bring you out of it. Let me, let me say this real closely, and I want you to listen to me real well, and I know what I'm saying. I would not wish this upon my worst enemy. I don't want you to have my life. You say, well, but you're a pastor of a church. You're, you're a registered nurse. You, you do so much. You know. Let me tell you, I would not want you to have my life. And I don't know why I have my life. Because sometimes it gets so overwhelming that I don't feel like I can want to go on. You ever been there? You ever been to where you just get to the edge and you think, man, Lord, one more thing and you don't have to push me, Lord. One more thing, you don't have to push me. I'm going to jump. I'm quitting. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't say that. I'm being honest with you. I would not wish this upon you or upon anybody. This is what children can bring their father. What's going to make it better? Thank you. A dedicated desire to serve the Lord. I don't care if their names is known in the world. I don't care if they have millions upon millions of dollars. I don't care if they live in the biggest house in whatever city that they live. Miss Connie, because I'm 60 years old and I've seen in all these years that there is nothing that is going to satisfy my children and my grandchildren except serving the Lord. No matter what you do here is temporary. But what you do for the Lord is eternal. And yet I can't get children, your children, my children, anyone else's children, to get their eyes off of the world to look at the wonder of eternity. And that's what is, is what I want today for Father's Day is this, a dedicated desire by my children to serve the Lord. I would rather them dig ditches or dig wells in Africa or in Asia for the glory of God than to run Microsoft or Google. Amen? Yeah, it'd be, ni it'd be nice to live in Bill Gates's. No, never mind. Bill Gates lives in Seattle and it's on fire. But wouldn't it be nice? I mean, if your children said, Here, Dad, here's your new keys to your Lamborghini. Now, we, can you imagine me and Sheila in a Lamborghini? We pull up here, and Sheila's got this big long fur on. Look what, look what my daughter bought me. And she flaps that thing around like like, like Zsa Zsa Gabor. And you, say, and you wave at Sheila, and she says, wonder why she didn't wave at me. Well, it's because her youngest son bought her such a diamond, she can't even get her hand up. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, we would be so spoiled in about 1.5 seconds. We, we'd just be, we'd be all over ourselves. But let me tell you, what I want is a dedicated desire for my children. And by doing that, it all starts with a day of decision. I just want them to come home. I just want them to come home. Because I know that the only thing that's going to help them when I'm gone, now I'm being honest, God honest, serious with you, is not my 401. Is not fighting over my house. Is not fighting over my stock options. The only thing that is going to help them and my grandchildren is that they get a hold of the fact that Jesus Christ is everything. And when I leave this world, what would make me the greatest and happiest father is to have my children and my grandchildren and my wife around my bed testifying of the goodness of God and the hope, Brother Herman, 
that we'll meet again. That's it. That's all I got. That's it. That's all I've got. Would you bow your head with us, please? Missy, would you come just with a song? Don't know what... (laughs) Bless your heart, Missy. I don't know what kind of song you're going to sing, but whatever it is, I know God has spoke to your heart. I'm asking you this morning, what about if you're a child and you've got a father, what are you bringing him today? What are you bringing? You say, well, I got him, I got him a card. <laughs> well, yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. But in the backdrop of what I've spoke of today, what are you bringing your father? If you're a father, I'm just... I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to be honest and real with you and let you know that some of the struggles that you go through, I go through. And that you and I, if we have a desire for our children to see God, we just got to hold on for that decision that they make and pray that they dedicate themselves to the Lord. That our life and that our leadership and our love hasn't been wasted in vain over temporal things. I don't know what you need to do with this message. I know that I've done what I needed to do, which is to speak from my heart to you about my life. And I have. We're going to have a song here in just a second. If the Lord wants you to come forward and pray for your dad or pray for your children or pray for your community, pray for your pastor, whatever, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. If nobody comes forward, you say, well, Pastor, that was a waste of a sermon. No. It's not. Because at least now, I can honestly look back and say, God, you spoke to me and I spoke to them. And though I feel terrible, <laughs> though, though I will feel for the next few days that I should have went another way, I should have did another thing, I should not have been so open. Father, I know that you spoke to me and said, today's the day, Brian. So I do. I just want to be obedient to you. God, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. And now do that which I cannot do. Change your heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's missing.